Hey there, chemists. In this crash course, we're going to look at interparticle forces, uh, exclusively qualitatively. How do we talk about the time types of things that keep molecules and substances held together, and how does that relate to their physical properties? First, it's worth breaking it down into a couple of categories. Uh, the strongest forces of attraction are found in what are called network covalent substances. That's when you have very strong covalent bonds connecting things. So for example, uh, carbons, allotropes of graphite or diamond um, are a continuum, a three-dimensional continuum of covalent bonds between all these carbon atoms. I'm drawing it flat, but you should know it is not two-dimensional. It's actually three-dimensional for something like graphite, and it just keeps going. So you actually break covalent bonds when you melt. So they have among the highest forces of attraction. Uh, then you get to things like ionic substances, ionic solids. Uh, those are clusters of ions that are positively and negatively charged, arranged. So little cations and big anions and little cations and big anions, etc., etc. And this explains why when you dissolve them in water, uh, you get ions that are mobile. They're not conductive when they are in the solid state, but if you can break these apart by putting them in water or melting them, then you can get mobile ions and you can get conduction. This also shows why if you uh, try to break ionic solids, uh, you'll actually force you know, a layer of these ions to, to shift and you would end up getting, you know, let's say one layer stayed the same but now the other layer is, is shifted, and as a result, you would have a series of positive charges next to each other and negative charges next to each other, and it would break apart. That's why ionic substances are brittle. It's because of that arrangement that happens when you force that damage. Uh, next, we get to metallic solids. Metallic solids are essentially positively charged nuclei of whatever substance you're talking about, and they are swimming in a sea of mobile electrons so that they conduct uh, and they are malleable because if you tried to do what we just did up here, you would still have contact with the nuclei and the electrons and you wouldn't break it. So metals bend, they don't break as easily as let's say ionic solids. Then the last one, but perhaps the one you've seen the most, are molecular substances. If something is molecular, then we have to talk about its intermolecular forces, its IMFs, of which there are three. The dispersion forces, the dipole-dipole forces, and the H-bonding forces. Dispersion forces are with every molecule. The more electrons, you have the stronger. So big molecules with lots of electrons, proteins, waxes, giant plastics, have a lot of electrons. They have very strong intermolecular forces as a result. So they have things like high, high boiling points and melting points. It's worth noting, uh, if you have strong IMFs, then you have a relatively high melting point likewise a relatively high boiling point, but a low uh, vapor pressure. Those go hand in hand because they all have to do with things sticking to themselves. And if you boil something or melt something or vaporize something, you have to break the IMFs. They're not covalent bonds, but they're forces of attraction between separate molecules. And the stronger they are, uh, the higher those properties become for melting and boiling. Dipole forces are just if it's more polar, it's stronger. Uh, so polar compounds have a pre-existing dipole and then holds those molecules together. H-bonding is this most specific one. It's, it's notoriously strong considering how much it changes the properties of certain molecules. It happens anytime you have a molecule like water where you have an existing lone pair attached to an oxygen or a nitrogen or a fluorine. So it only works with nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and it has to have a lone pair and an H on that same atom. So the three most common examples are water, uh, which if water were to H bond, 
Remember, it's an intermolecular force between two molecules, so it would look like that. It's the force of attraction between an H on one molecule and a lone pair on the other. That's the H bond. Uh, HF is another notorious example that can do this, as is NH3. Those are the three most common. Okay, this is such a qualitative topic that I feel like it's worthwhile just to go do some practice problems, uh, but that's a crash rundown in, in what, we, what we mean by interparticle forces. So let's look at some questions. Firstly, gases can be converted to liquids at 20 degrees by compressing them to a higher pressure. That's true. Why is it possible to liquefy ammonia at a lower pressure than carbon dioxide? In other words, it's easier to liquefy ammonia. That's what that means. I don't need to compress it as much. Ammonia molecules want to stick together. And if I think about what might be the answer without even looking at the choices, and I consider ammonia versus CO2, ammonia can H-bond, but CO2 can't. CO2 has dispersion only. So ammonia molecules want to stick to each other. So uh let's see co2 is non-polar so let's let's just go through the choices the average speed of ammonia molecules is greater than co2 molecules that's a true statement but it doesn't have anything to do with where they change phase and by the way ammonia is faster because it's smaller ammonia has a smaller molar mass it weighs 17 as opposed to co2 which weighs 44 so that's a true statement but it doesn't have to do with the question co2 is non-polar that's true and no significant imfs uh, but ammonia has strong dispersion forces. Well, everything has dispersion forces, but actually CO2 would have stronger dispersion forces because it's a bigger molecule. It has more electrons. So B is just a false statement. CO2 and NH3 are nonpolar already. That's an incorrect statement. Ammonia is polar. So C is incorrect. So it must be D. Let's check. CO2 is nonpolar. Yep. And its dispersion forces are weaker than the dipole, dipole, and dispersion forces of ammonia. That is the best answer to that question. They didn't even comment on the H bonding in ammonia, but it's also there. All right, next. Methanol dissolves in water, but does not conduct electricity, which shows the major type of interaction that occurs between particles in methanol and water in the solution. Ah, so this is looking for the H bonding of both of them, even though they're different molecules. And this is a good example of how Different molecules can form intermolecular forces. They don't always have to be with another molecule of itself. It could be a different molecule altogether. So we're looking for a dashed line between a lone pair and a hydrogen. Uh, so A and B are out. D is out because you're not going to have charges. That would be some kind of acid-base reaction between those two. But C certainly looks like the best answer. There's a good H bond between a lone pair on methanol and an H on a water molecule. Alternatively, it could have shown the H on methanol bonding with the lone pair on water. That would also be a correct drawing. Next, the diagram below best helps to explain which property of a metallic solid. So here's that sea of electrons, which we already said in the beginning is why it's malleable, it can bend, and also why it conducts. So let's see, electrical conductivity because it shows a lattice of positive ions immersed in a sea of electrons. Well, that's true, uh, but it looks like there's something special in this drawing that shows how they're trying to shear a layer of uh, the metal differently from a different layer of the metal. And that really has to do with malleability, the fact that it can bend. Metals bend. And this explanation right here is a great... Uh, way of trying to learn the kind of wording that they would want students to use on a free response question. So this shows the malleability because it shows how adjacent layers of ions, positive ions, can move and still remain in contact with the electron C. That's why metals bend and why they're not brittle. Moving on, here's another one that looks like we have shear forces and, and notice what's going on here. This is clearly, without even reading the question, looks like an ionic solid, they've sheared it, and now we have like charges repelling each other, so it breaks apart. That's why ionic solids are brittle. Didn't even have to read the question, just kind of had to look at the diagram very carefully. Next, which of the following shows an interstitial alloy? Ah, we didn't even talk about alloys in the opening segment. Alloys 
are mixtures of atoms that behave like metals. They're usually mixtures of metals, but sometimes it's a metal and a non-metal. And I think it's useful to just label what all these diagrams actually are. D just looks like a pure solid. So it's not a mixture. Uh, C looks like an ionic solid, but also not an alloy. A and B are the alloys. A is actually the interstitial because it has these little extra elements that are in between. They're in the spaces in between uh, the larger, perhaps, metal. This is probably, you know, little carbon atoms in between the spaces of iron atoms or something like that. And maybe that's the alloy steel or something like that. B is also an alloy, but B is an example of a substitutional alloy. Substitutional alloys are where you put similarly sized atoms and they occupy the space of pre-existing atoms. So the arrangement kind of looks the same, uh, but they have different properties as a result of it just being a different metal. And that explains a lot about alloys actually, but there's only just those two. Primarily for the AP exam, you really just need to be able to identify particle diagrams about which ones are which. Usually interstitial alloys are often a metal plus a much smaller non-metal. And substitutional alloys are usually, not always, but usually a metal plus another metal because they'll have similar sizes, whereas metals and non-metals will often have very different sizes. Okay, last multiple choice. Consider the two allotropes of carbon, diamond and graphite. What explains why diamond is harder than graphite. Well, there's that continuum of network covalent bonds in diamond. Looks like there aren't bonds between these layers of graphite. So let's see, diamond contains covalent bonds, but graphite contains ionic bonds. No way, that's a false statement. Diamond contains ionic bonds. No way, that's also a false statement. Carbon atoms in diamond have four covalent bonds, whereas graphite is made of layers held together by a relatively weak Dispersion forces, that sounds correct. Let's just check D to make sure. Carbon atoms in diamond have a sea of mobile electrons. No, that's gonna be a metal. And that's not true. However, the graphite does contain delocalized electrons uh, and graphite does conduct, conduct. Graphite actually has p orbitals. This is a little bit more than you need to know for this question, but it's a good way to show you. There's what's called a continuous pi system in graphite. And that's actually why the, the graphite in your pencil, if you're writing with one right now, can conduct because you have these clouds of electrons in between uh, layers of graphite. That's also why it flakes off on a piece of paper so easily. Uh, but the correct answer to this is C. Carbon atoms have four covalent bonds and graphite is made of layers held together by relatively weak dispersion forces. Okay, let's wrap up with just some free response questions, all qualitative. The diagram below shows xenon in three states, but only liquid. Draw a diagram for solid and gaseous. <laughs> all you need to know is that a solid state would be a very ordered arrangement of atoms stacked closely together and in a nice arrangement. I wouldn't fill the whole box, I might just do two or even three layers of atoms. I'm not even checking if I'm counting the right number. That's a little bit tedious, but clearly this looks like a solid compared to a liquid. So what would a gas look like? No order at all and quite spread out as a result. This is not even that accurate because gases are often a thousand times less dense than liquids and solids. So I'm imagining grading this I would probably look for the same type of atom. I'm not all of a sudden gonna draw a much larger or a much smaller atom. They're just spread out. That's it. That's how the phases exist. Can't believe that's even a question they asked. And lastly, uh, here's something about the molecule called uh, urea, which happens to be able to form hydrogen bonds. This is a, a coded particle diagram with oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen, and they wanna show one dashed line to indicate a possible hydrogen bond between the urea molecule and the water molecule. I'm actually gonna label what atoms are present here. There's your oxygen and there's your hydrogen and hydrogen. And in the urea, that's gonna be your carbon, 
whereas that's your oxygen. Those are your nitrogens according to the key. And then we have hydrogens over here. Uh, so what type of H bond could form? Well, let's figure out where my lone pairs are. My lone pairs are gonna be on the oxygens of water. They're gonna be on the oxygens of the urea molecule. And I'm also gonna have a lone pair on the nitrogens of the urea. So if I had to show an H bond between one molecule and another molecule of water and urea, uh, which hydrogens can do it? Well, the well, all the hydrogens can, because they just have to be attached to an oxygen or a nitrogen, and there has to be a pre-existing lone pair on that oxygen or nitrogen. So that hydrogen can do it, and that hydrogen can do it. Which lone pairs can do it? And actually, we're in luck. All the lone pairs can H-bond, because the only lone pairs I have are attached to oxygen or nitrogen. So I could draw one possible right answer, let's say between one of the H's, and a lone pair on the oxygen right here. That would be a perfectly acceptable answer. And I'd be done. I'd be given full credit. Uh, alternatively, I could show one of the H's in the NH2 group attached to the oxygen of a neighboring water molecule. That would also be correct, although they said draw only one, so I'm only going to draw one. So that's a good review of some practice questions related to interparticle forces. Uh, thanks for watching.